Okay. Right. Uh, system shock. Because the last uh, year or so, I received a grant from EPSRC to actually, because of COVID-19, and they were very keen to find out whether uh, we can recover from COVID-19. It's very funny because they sent around in the first wave, I said, there might be second wave, but third wave. So they start coughing up some money for social scientists like me to actually looking at that. So I looked at system shock uh, for the last um, uh, few years, uh, well, a year or so. But there's, when you actually start looking at something, conceptually, you need to really clear, have some clear definition of it. The term system shock refers to unexpected internal and an external event which stress and challenges a system. The transient or short-term responses of a system to such a shock depending on the system's operational in infrastructure, whether there's lots of redundancy or not. And you know that redundancy makes the system stronger, but it's more expensive. Uh, they determine the degradedness. Uh, is it easy to degrade uh, when it initially, when the, when the system actually got shocked? Uh, one of the stuff that we uh, did uh, in our so last year, so 18 months or so, is looking at the August 2019 blackout near London. Uh, there's a um, paper called Lost Generation now uh, that you, you might want to look at and how we can recover from two gigawatt uh, loss of electricity in just a short time and how it actually coupled with renewables. Um, and in, in the system need to take time to recover and sometimes they recover very quickly. But even that small shock of two gigawatt that it would cover about, uh, some, some recover quickly, it actually linger on about three or four days and cost quite a lot of money. So if the system is resilient, um, then you can actually return to your normal operation, your trains running and your hospital is still running, and that's good. But if not, it will be a lot of problem. Uh, what we call the critical infrastructure will be affected. Um, you, all of you may remember Texas in 2019 as well, isn't it? 20. Winter of 20, um, 2020. Texas is actually uh, was, uh, completely devastated. In, it's it's a lost uh, the whole entire uh, energy system for about a week. And now the bills rack up for that uh, uh, shock. Is about 150 billion, and the the whole entire board uh, have resigned. The ERCOT board that actually govern the system. So it is important to actually looking at the resilience of the system. And fragility. If a if a system fragile, that means that you are not responding very well, and then it goes into a cascade of. Um, can you? Next slide, cascade of uh, failure. So again, sometimes systems just can tolerate for a lot of short-term sh uh, shock. Um, it depends on understanding how we respond in the short-term one. Because in the short-term, we can respond. We learn from it, like what we're talking about, learning from it and getting strength in ourselves, our system, like our building system, to uh, resist these shocks. So if a system is evolvable, if we can actually think about how our system can be effectively and conveniently modified uh, or upgraded, can be said to be evolvable. So is the building system, so is the energy system. Can we go? Okay, during the pandemic, academics were already concerned with health consequences of the lockdown. Some researchers already studied previous economic recessions and the impact they had on health in the long term. And there were other, I wouldn't call the proper 2020, already look at the impact of the availability of healthcare and how the pandemic has strained on the NHS. You hear all the time, you know, doctors is actually uh, striking and, and nurses, it's a strain, there's signs of symptoms of stress of our health system. And when uh, Yankee et tell look at back at 2008 recession, he linked the recession and saw 1% in 
increase in unemployment will lead to 2% increase of chronic illnesses and mental health conditions. This we hear from time to time, you know, there are a lot more people getting ill. We now have empirical evidence for impacts. Herbie of the Institute of Economic Affairs and actually put, come out with um, tries over report now. So they went around to research. Uh, the first one is in 2020. And now it's come out with a very, very recent one, 2023. They concluded the lockdown measures in spring of 2020 had a negligible effect on COVID-19 mortality. Means the lockdown didn't really protect that many people. But they list a litany of social costs. For example, decline in children's health schooling, quality of life, mental health, increase in domestic violence. And the total cost of lockdown to the economy, as you see here, well, we're talking about economy, decline in economy activity and growth, disruption in global trade and production, and an increase in unemployment. Many people now with being laid off, particularly in America, they'll be you know, you envisage of millions of layoff. Government intervention to boost demand through various programs. These support measures were financed by increasing government borrowing, raising public debt to exceptionally high level in many countries. These fiscal policies become extremely expansionary with a fiscal deficit being monetized by central banks. And I think if you not knowing what the central bank's doing, uh, you should find out a little bit more about it. This given rise to a surge in the quantity of money held by the public, which with a lag effect, produced record level inflation in many countries. So you hear all this inflation. It's not just about Ukraine, um, sort of war or whatever. There's something to do with a long-term, there are long-term uh, causes for that. I put up, oh, can you uh, give me? Yeah, this, this is a, a diagram to show you how complicated our lockdown policy was in comparison <laughs> to Sweden and Denmark, you know? And, and this kind of policies is actually very detrimental to social and economic life. Can I pass on that now? Yeah, another, another slide, next. Um, a couple of years before COVID, Hennefeld et al. studied how to strengthen the health system in relation to three kinds of shocks. They look at a pandemic but using Ebola experience, financial crisis, and climate change. Next slide. They have focused on three ways of strengthening the health system. These are health management information system, funding and financing mechanism, and the health force, uh, workforce. However, their understanding of how health system can help with responding to climate change is very, very narrow. They focus mainly on information available on forecasting natural disasters and extreme weather events hoping to prepare the health system by having systematic forecasts of climate events related to health changes. I don't blame them because it's, it, we are limited, our knowledge is very limited, we are very monodisciplined. This paper might go some way, their paper, to explain the content of the recent WHO Pandemic Preparedness Treaty. I hope you all listen to it, have, have signed to reject that. Because it's zero draft on the accord, it stipulates strongly obligation for information sharing and the importance of having a strong health workforce and universal health care. I, I wouldn't dispute the, the latter two, but I think the, we're edging towards something uh, difficult, I think, a cross-global data collection. In the light of the performance of the WHO during the pandemic, I will leave you to make your own judgment whether this transnational an elected organization should be granted such a huge power. By the way, I used to actually work with the WHO in terms of migrant um, issue in Europe. Uh, next, next slide. Inevitably, researchers looking at health shocks tend to focus on human health and how it is dynamically related to health of the economy through things like unemployment. They tend to miss the role of energy system 
If you think about who benefit from the lockdown, the designation of certain economic activity is very, as essential activity is very clear. You know, like Netflix and, you know, laptop, or I call the laptop cars, the people who are mobile, some people call themselves uh, nomad capitalists because they can work anywhere in the world, like Colombia or Thailand, and they continue to operate. Um, who, who really suffer? People suffer a low income group. They have no alternative but have to go into work like train drivers, underground uh, tube drivers. Some of these people have no savings. More critically, a family with young children and pregnant mothers. Okay, can you next? We might think that we are out of the wood now because we no longer wear masks. Uh, we, I don't know whether the jobs are going to come back. I have no idea. Um, but as a nation, we're still living with excess mortality. This graph, I just pulled it out, I think, yesterday, because I always update my size. And you can see now, it's September, we still suffer an all cause mortality, uh, nearly, is it about 10,000? Yeah, COVID death is actually, uh, see if I can, COVID death is actually here, yeah. No doubt that there's a lag effect that some people will die of COVID, but here it should not, but it's still there. But this big watch of people dying, and actually quite consistent up till now, you start to wonder why. And it will actually, uh, this kind of death could eventually uh, weaken our economic system, particularly with the age group. If you go into ONS, yeah, official national statistics. We will find that people dying are not just old people. They are very young people. Um, next slide. Meanwhile, we should look at what kind of shocks experienced by the energy system and see whether some of these basic principles, like I was talking about, about the health system, could see, uh, similarly apply to understand them and their impact. Can you see that? short term and you know the same principle next slide yeah during the lockdown economic inactivity result in energy demand reduction we all think that, oh yeah we're not we're not going to work and we say at home to work must be a huge reduction but by how much we saw not so much it turns out demand reduction is not only affected by economic inactivity but other variables such as warmer weather, whether it's warmer, we got a quite mild weather, uh, so winter there in the last two years, and changes in energy mix of fuel of electricity generation. Now, this is UK, this graph is UK by Malik, but in global study by a new Z et al, and Nature Communication 2020, I can give you the reference you want to, they said globally, the economic slowdown caused by COVID-19 demonstrates just how challenging it will be to reduce emissions rap uh, rapidly, just like Bob was saying. Carbon dioxide emissions during the first half of 2020 were down only 8.8% globally. Everybody closed down, do you remember? Compared to the same period in 2019, with 40% of those reductions coming from service transport and 22% from electricity sector. Remember, we still need energy to fossil to generate uh, electricity. Wind just won't hack it. And emission rebound promptly in many countries as restriction eased. This involuntary demand reduction and the collapse in oil and gas prices at that time, and gas demand led energy researchers to suggest that oh, this might be a great opportunity to start an accelerated transition. They were really gleefully, they think this reduction demand is the way, is the opportunity to do that. Perhaps it was. From this perspective, renewable and new energy technology available at progressively lower cost, they thought, we'll take over. Everybody's thinking wind and solar are really cheap, they're free, right? Fossil fuel will be in permanent surplus at lower prices eventually enter a death spiral as investors move away from this sector for high return elsewhere. Now, what did you see at the time? Can I have a next slide? After COVID, this slide, we observe energy prices in the UK shot up. 
Multiple factors such as lack of gas storage availability, which some of you may know already, uh, because we're systematically not thinking about storing uh, reserves. And the large shale gas in heating have exacerbated the supply, supply issue in the UK. This led to multiple supply announcing bankruptcy. You remember all this uh, DNO, Distributed uh, uh, Energy uh, com Company, eight, I think nine uh, or nine of them have gone bankrupt. While an up uh, uh, price cap is threatened the energy security of numerous households. Exceptionally high gas prices since the latter half of 2021 have been attributed to an energy supply shortage as a result of lower pipeline supplies from Norway and Russia. And of course now we don't have Nord Stream 2. And Nord Stream 1 was also uh, shut down. Um, but at the same time, that we have to be aware that there's LNG was actually, um, and shell gas and, and, the, and the product of energy is actually being exported by the USA. And if you go and look at the data, their last five years in USA have been, hitherto they have not actually exported any LNG. The last five years or six years now, before, uh, when I first looked at them, they are exported everywhere in the world. And in fact, in Germany, there were five LNG terminals going to be built. And you know who built it them? Very quickly. A any guess? It's built by China. All right. <laughs> Anything you want fast, built by China. <laughs> they got the people. Um, consequently, um, the United Kingdom, because all this competition with the LNG as well, because Asia also needs LNG, the United Kingdom has some of the highest household electricity price worldwide. So some of you, when I actually talked to community group uh, in Derby and some really low income group, they were so anxious why the uh, electricity bill or the energy bill was so high, they didn't really understand what happened. Like, well, you know, we're supposed to have this uh, wind and solar, you know, why we have such a high, high, high bill, high, uh, high price bill. 70% of the UA, UK household use gas for heating. Don't forget, we still do. Household expenditure on energy from gas in UK stood at some 13.2 billion British pounds in 2021. Now, could this dominance of gas for home heating represent the vulnerability of our energy system, as you remember, make us fragile? So again, there is a kind of urge to get away from gas. Yeah, dash for get away from gas. Next. I've just sort of clipped it. This is on BP. And BP will tell you that, you know, the impact of LNG on natural gas market. When uh, natural gas actually uh, come out, it actually have an impact on global gas prices. It's, it's important to recognize the UK energy market is subject to dynamic of global energy market. Yeah, we must remember that. Nothing you can do about it. Global primary energy consumption has been increasing for at least 200 years. Coal, oil, natural gas continue to dominate the global energy mix. Although wind and solar have been gaining ground, their share in energy mix of consumption remain less than 12%. This is UK at 2021. In 2021, UK's natural gas price has amounted the highest in the world. It's dropping slightly now. Before February 2022, when the Ukraine-Russia conflict began and the US and EU sanctioned Russia oil and gas supply, the UK had already experienced 500% increase in wholesale gas price. Heavily dependent on import gas, the UK has been particularly vulnerable to price spikes in the wholesale market. Among the factors that keep prices high is the fact that although the economists acknowledge pandemic that led to geopolitical economic events like lockdown and reopening, because they tried to blame it on that for the COVID, in which wave systems, uh, in which system supply shock of commodities ensued, they have failed at least to give explanation or to provide any understanding of the underlying factor that have led to this present crisis. What I'm arguing is that there's more to it. Can I have the next? There was a noticeable change. You know, we had to actually step back a little bit and looking at from 1970, if you can go on. This, this is all available 
publicly uh, in the government website. There was noticeable change between 1970 to 2020. See if you can spot that. Anybody can spot that? Between the blue line and the green line. Yeah, anybody? Yeah, you can. Perhaps we had talked about that. Service seemed to have, a, have held con constant. Industry blue in the blue appeared in decline. Yeah, can you go to 1990? Transport has been on the way out and had an obvious dip in 2020, as you know that is because of COVID. The domestic sector appeared to be slightly up between 1990 and 2010 and then drop back to more or less the same as 1970. So the most remarkable change here is between transport and the decline of our industry in the UK. Okay, that's why, because we ship goods from everywhere. The goods will change around the late 1980s. Um, so what happened to UK and its consumption pattern? Let's look at the next slide, the same slide, but I want to say, that to understand the predicament we are in, we have to understand the social economic context in the UK and as its part in the wider world. We would no longer be just a, in a really island. Over these five decades, UK has gone through a change from a country of, uh, with wealth, GDP, based on manufacturing to service, and the concomitant evolution of its pattern with energy consumption. Along with this economic chain, the physical and social infrastructure also evolved. Most noticeably, we can observe between late 1980s and early 1990s. These changes were driven by many factors that implicated geopolitical economic decision of economic power, such as a G7, as everybody knows. In particular, the relations uh, between US and China. The decision to admit China into the WTO, World Trade Organization, triggered the rise of China as a powerful industrial nation, the workshop of the world. Western nations gradually de-industrialized, including America, now looking like Germany is rapidly de-industrialized, and metamorphosis into service economy. US now is over 70% service economy, you will easily find data to support my observation. You may want to ponder the impact of de-industrialization on social change. Okay, next one. Look at this. Good news, construction not being affected. <laughs> Why? Anyone has a guess? Your house has always been the same, almost. Yeah, this is a workforce, not material, workforce. We're always people building, yeah? And the people who serve the service e economies are huge. Lots of people now uh, making your latte in the morning, um, whatever, <laughs> and sorting out your mortgage. Uh, this graph shows the decline of labor force in agriculture and manufacturing from 1841. Look at agriculture, it's miserable. And the huge expansion of the service sector, as I say, interestingly, of construction the same. In other words, UK has become a service economy. Next slide. I want to skip this because it's something everybody knows now. Women actually joined the workforce very rapidly in the 1980s. Okay, this, uh, this slide, sorry, next slide. This slide actually look at the service economy, what it means by service economy. It's not just about making your lattes. It actually encompasses public sector and private sector. The NHS and health and social care are actually taking 19% of our GDP. We might want to think about what happened to our infrastructure with all these services economy. I'll really finish now, okay? Next slide. Through this carbon emission graph, we can see the change of the UK economy in a longer perspective, 1750. Yeah, back a bit again. I will not go on any period earlier than 1979. Between 1970 and 1993, as uh, we, I, I put it out here, yeah? Britain took a downturn. Unemployment 
was 6.7%. Within this period, Britain began to deindustrialize. The country lost its heavy industry, such as coal mining, steel making, and shipbuilding. This is not our intention to argue here whether the deindustrialization process was a conscious economic policy of British government to restructure the nation's economy. History coming into this here, we suggest that the process of decolonization, if people are interested in that, go back and look at the history of colony and decolonization, ushered the rise of globalization, which in turn has a huge impact on energy consumption pattern across the globe in general, and in Britain in particular. Next. I I wouldn't actually go too much into it. We can talk about it. This is the economist, they actually leading the decouple movement. Decouple means that you don't need to use too much energy and have a, better, uh, a lot of GDP, just like Ireland now. You can go into world in data and look at the status of Ireland. Ireland becomes the richest country in the world with very low energy consumption. You might wonder why. The next slide, please. I'm gonna finish this. So you can actually see there's a dynamic in the system shocks revealed to us here. Um, system within system. Complex system display emergent behavior. We are at the cusp of an emergence. Our economic crisis is not just a consequence of the energy crisis. On the contrary, the economic crisis is part of the energy crisis that we need to face. The solution is not simply getting rid of fossil fuels, from our energy system, not so hasty. We need them to prescribe solution. We need to understand the nature of our system, how they entwine, interact, and produce phenomena that are complex and difficult to disentangle. Next one. In thinking about sustainability, I really love to hear you quite often still remember these 17 sustainability goals. And our goal to reach net zero, we need to think about not only about technology, but about how society can sustain itself when we may have to live with the consequences of deindustrialization, like using, you know, uh, used material. Endemic unemployment, we might face that. Ill health and excess mortality brought on by pandemics. More pandemic may come. All these have the potential to create yet again a long-lasting structural change in UK economy through depreciation of skills. That is in the other things I think about AECDB would do is to look at much bigger you know, picture around skill to hold, help to promote the skill that you have. Uh, human capital, again, grow human capital and social capital, like those that actually talked about by, is it uh, Charlie? Yeah, you, you talked about you know, making the kind of society small way, but you know, in some way quite you know, congenial to well-being. And can we envision a different world? I think it's really important not to actually continue to think that we can do this the same. <laughs> we have to actually imagine a new world, a world with dwindling resource and expensive energy, and how can we flip things around? Next. And if you want to think about, you can continue business as usual. Can we respond to today's shock and future shock if our government financial wealth is as such? Look right in the red. See? We are among the last six, seven. It's miserable. And look at the debt. Next, next slide. Look at the debt that we owe. 104% of GDP. We can't even, we spend more than we produce. Okay, next slide. So you might wish to think about what might be the obstacle for recovery. We all talk about shocks and recovery and rebuilding our economy and society after the information given to this presentation. I think there's a lot there. There's a really dense uh, presentations, a lot of food for thought. And we would like to have this conversation with you over you know, lunch and maybe over the, the day that when you go find them, cup of tea and grab this. Um, the last, next, last one is, um, these are our references. There are more references there. So if you like to have those uh, references, we can actually, on request, we can furnish you with them. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.